Hi, my name's Aaron. I'm here at Provo, and I'm talking to a friend named Hannah. We are at um, Center Street and uh, University Boulevard uh, near Provo City Center Temple. Um, so we were talking about uh, the idea that if Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal, who would have paid for his sins? Uh, Hannah, uh, what were the different categories or options? So I, I've heard of the idea that Jesus has paid for the sins of many worlds that are under our Heavenly Father, but you introduced another idea I had not heard before. Uh, what was that idea? Sure. So there's an, also an idea that because the language in Doctrine and Covenants just says that Jesus Christ paid for the sins of many worlds and then the inhabitants thereof, that's also in the, the scripture heading um, in the Doctrine and Covenants, which is canonized and part of the Doctrine and Covenants, that that could apply to worlds outside of Heavenly Father. The church position is not official on this, so that's just one interpretation that is out there besides the first interpretation, which is the primary interpretation that there are multiple different saviors for multiple different worlds for multiple different worlds. So, clarifying, in one view, um, Jesus pays for the sins of all those who are in the worlds under Heavenly Father. Correct. And in the second view, which I had not heard of till today, um, is that Jesus perhaps paid for even the sins of Heavenly Father. Yes. And that, that's a, I personally don't adhere to that view. That's a, a view that people adhere to based on a specific theory of time. So if you have this idea that time is completely linear, then that one would make sense because then we say that Jesus Christ's atonement is infinitely regressive and also infinitely progressive. So in this model, uh, when Jesus was redeemed, I'm sorry, when Heavenly Father was forgiven or redeemed, he was doing so on the basis of his own son's sacrifice to yet be accomplished. Sure, similar to how when you have the high priest sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant for the sins of the people of Israel and the sins of his family, that that is an act of forgiveness. And forgiveness is inherent even on the forgiveness points towards Jesus Christ. Okay, so I've never heard that before. Have you? genuinely heard people express this. I've genuinely heard people express it. It tends to be people who are more progressive Mormons. Um, that tends to be the camp of people that express this more often than the traditional Latter-day Saint. So in this view, is there a regression of gods? There is a regression of gods, and it would be a completely linear regression of gods. So it would just be Heavenly Father, Heavenly Grandfather, Great Grandfother, and so forth. There isn't a more, there isn't more of a tree, it's a line. Why, why not a tree? Because then the, the belief is that some people don't want to achieve God. And that some people want to have... Oh, sorry, not some people don't want to achieve God. Some people don't want to be gods in the celestial sense of eternal increase, but they want to be gods in the more of a beatific sense, if that makes sense. Beatific? Like, yeah, like... Yeah. So in that model, Heavenly Father still has children, but only one of them becomes... Super deity? According to that model, yes, which I don't think is correct. But there's, okay. that, there, there's the possibility for that, yeah. Okay, so in the second, where it's in the first model, where the atonement covers all the, the sins of those who are of the worlds under Heavenly Father, yes. this world is special. How is this world special? Okay, I, 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 let me ask you. Okay, yeah. I read. Uh, some of Andrew Skinner's work. Okay. And it seems like he believes that our world is particular in that the atonement was accomplished on this planet for the sake of other planets. That, that would be true. Um, I wouldn't say that that necessarily qualifies our There's been a couple of... Uh, there's been a couple of theories on that. Uh, one of the theories is that this Earth is more sinful. We're laughing because of the motorcycle. Yeah, so, so yeah. <laughs> There's so that this particular world is full of sinners, but I, sh I, I assume that in that model, other worlds had sinners too. Yeah, other worlds had sinners too, but there's a theory that th this world was more sinful than other worlds. But again, that's not a doctrinal thing. That is a, a that's an opinion. That's a well-formed opinion of several prophets. Okay, and what is your personal take on all this? My personal take on all of this is that there is an infinite regress of gods, and it's more of a tree sense where the sins, of, the sins of this world and the world under the tutelage of Heavenly Father were atoned for by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, and that there are other saviors of other worlds for other gods. This is more of a Brigham view. Yes. Oh, totally. So multiple saviors over different branches of, of the family tree of the gods. Definitely. 
and our Savior paid for the sins of Heavenly Father's branch. Yes. And if there are subsequent deities exalted, they will send their own firstborn son or son? Yeah, I believe it is the firstborn son. I believe that's, a, I believe that's an eternal pattern. Uh, is it a chronological firstborn or is it like a preeminent, uh, like a, is it like secondborn who becomes preeminent? Uh, I would say it's first, it first and only begotten unto the Father. So I think that there is a spiritual creation as well as a physical creation. I believe we are spiritually created from intelligences that we're refined from intelligences, which is described as kind of like this weird matter that still has mass to it. Um, so I would say that it's the first spiritual and physical creation of the Father and the Mother. So I have a question about that. Sure. Latter-day Saints are really big on free agency. Yes. So how would you be able to, if that model was consistent, it seems like coincidental that the firstborn is particular and unique and worthy of, of satisfying that. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I would say that Cleon Skousen, right, in the Gospel Trilogy, talks a lot about how intelligences will obey the will of the Father. So I think that that also kind of... Like little particles or like people? Um, so there are different theories about intelligence. Because Skousen takes the crap view, right? Yeah, he does. Um, I personally believe that intelligences are actually people. I believe intelligence is almost synonymous with spirit. That seems to be the logical use of it in Abraham and Moses. Um, so I would say that ordination does not negate free agency. Also, <laughs> I would say that you can, because you're an intelligence, you are consistent with the will of God because as a creation of God, you would want to live in order to, I believe that your desires have not fallen. So your desires would be to be completely aligned with God. Right, because coming to this world is what makes desires fall. No, nothing, or the, or no, the like, introduction of evil. Capacity for falling and pre-mortality? I think there is capacity for falling and pre-mortality, and I think that's evidenced by Satan and also the fallen angels as well. So I wouldn't say that, but I would say that you are infinitely more likely to choose good because your nature is inherently good. Okay. But that doesn't mean you won't choose evil. But I would say that the, the possibility of that is very slim. I don't meet, I don't meet very many Larry Saints who thought through the issues like you have. So can I ask you another question? Yeah, go question? for it. Yeah. Um, so upon deification, um, what is the role of Godhead? Uh, yeah. So I, the way I've heard, I've heard two models. One um, is that there's like one giant Godhead, and then becoming exalted as a God means you join the, God, the, the bigger Godhead. And in the other view, um, our Godhead only has three deities, maybe their wives. I don't, I don't know. Um, and then upon uh, uh, Jesus's functioning as a heavenly Father for other worlds. He would belong to two godheads. Uh, he would be the father of a, of a future godhead, if that makes sure. sense. Yeah, yeah. The patriarch of a, a future godhead, and simultaneously belonging as the son to the other godhead. Yeah, so I would say that it's just kind of this family structure where you have heavenly father, heavenly mother, they have a, they have a son, their firstborn son will be the savior of the world, and then that son will eventually, I believe Jesus is married, um, I'm of the opinion that Jesus is married to Mary Magdalene, but okay. that's a Brigham and Joseph view. Um, but and Joseph it, Smith? Joseph Smith um, in like in like common folklore is said to have said that we don't have any documentation of him okay. saying that, that but we have second and third hands. So great of So godheads. Uh, mini godheads, one big godhead or mini godheads. Um, overlapping? Yes. And I, I'm okay with the overlap because I think it I think it mimics the family structure on the earth, if that makes sense. So okay. I would say that I would say that the idea of God, right? For me the idea of God is Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother combined, and that God the Father is a, is a distinction, right? So when we talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's comprising the Godhead. But I think this idea of God that we see, right, and he, the Hebrew word for it is Elohim, that's the one that I would use to describe what I think is Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. I think that their role is creation. I don't think the Godhead's role is creation. So that's kind of... Um, so that last part again, sorry. So um, I would say that Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother comprise God, and Elohim in Genesis, right, is the one who organizes the world and creates Adam and Eve. Elohim is the father in this model? Is the father and the mother. Generic, a generic label for father and mother. Mother, yeah. I think Elohim, yeah. since it means, so Elohim is technically a Hebrew plural, and you can read that as a majestic plural in the sense that God is so cool, and we need to use a plural to describe him. But I would actually read it in the sense that the tending towards a heavenly mother deity, and that it 
Just one? I'm not trying to be cute. No, 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 no. Just one in the, in the context of Genesis, just one. But okay. there are multiple heavenly fathers and heavenly mothers. I meant just one heavenly mother. Yes. Oh, I don't believe in polygamy in heaven. Nullified in the millennium? Yep. Okay, so many godheads. Um, so I've often heard that the oneness of the godhead is not an ontological oneness. Okay. It's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, in this traditional model at least, I, I assume there's like sufficient overlap with your view and the traditional yeah. views. Yeah. Not one-to-one -one relationship, sure, not official, yeah. but um, the, the godhead is not essentially one in, in, the, in the philosophical sense of they, uh, uh, their membership in the godhead wasn't always an essential part of their being. That, like they joined the Godhead or they formed the Godhead. It's, a, it's essential for the period that they're in the Godhead, but it's not essential to their entire existence okay. in the sense that they always were part of the Godhead. And it hasn't always been fundamental to their, to their existence to be in the Godhead. Yes and no. So no in the, in the practical sense that like they were not born into a Godhead and that was not the purpose of their initial creation. But yes in the sense because I believe in secular time that what, so on, like in a secular time scale model, what is actualized at one point in the past is actualized in the future. B so, theory? Yeah, so if something is going to happen, it has already happened. So I would say that that kind of resolves the essentiality argument in an interesting way. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's why I said yes and no. I wanted to be clear. In one sense, not their God, the Godhead isn't fundamental to their existence. In the B theory time, it is. Yes, and that's why I subscribe to the B theory time because I think we're going okay. I've heard the Latter Day Saint position described as that the Godhead is one because they're one in purpose. Yeah, one in purpose, one in meaning. That's a that's a common phrase that people use. Um, I think that that is true. I would agree that the Godhead is one in purpose, but I think the ins the essentiality and the co-eternalness of it is also important. And I think that by introducing me theory as something that I think explains our view quite well, that we're able to reconcile these differences and talk about essentiality in a more sophisticated way. So, if you have one God that it head that's one in purpose, sure. but you have other godheads, and you might have some godheads where they're overlapping membership. Yes. Um, if there's overlapping godheads, um, would they have distinct purposes? Well, in, I, in other words, yeah. if they're one in purpose, why not put... So this is where yeah. other Latter-day Saints have heard it described as, well, you eventually end up joining the same collective purpose, so yes. there ends up being a massive godhead that is the council of the gods, and that our particular Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is just sort of a subset representation of the larger Yeah, I've heard that expressed, yeah. Um, I would say that the council of the gods is a possibility. I'm not ruling it out. I don't think there's anything doctrinal besides the infinite regress of gods. Um, I would say that what I think of more... You think that infinite regress is doctrinal? It's doctrinal. On the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saint website, it, it says that it's doctrinal. If you look up that statement... I, um, I've seen it in the... Um, the hymn, If You Could Hide a Kolob. It's in If You Could Hide a Kolob, but also if you look it up on the website, there's a, actually, it's a question and answer section that asks if that couplet is doctrinal, and the answer is yes. Okay. So it is 100% doctrinal. The, um, the couplet does imply it, the grandfather. Yeah, okay. it does, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's 100% doctrinal. Um, but I would say the Council of Gods is a possibility. I'm not sure I would lean towards no. I would say that, right, so God's purpose and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of so I would say that that would constitute a oneness among all Godheads because then their purpose and glory would be to, sorry, their working glory would be, to, but also their purpose. They have the same purpose, yeah, they, so why aren't they the same Godhead? They aren't the same Godhead because they have different priesthood, res, not restriction, jurisdiction, different priesthood authority over specific so, so this is very different from the traditional Christian yes. views, whereas the oneness God is an absolute oneness that speaks of the universality and unlimited scope of his dominion. Whereas it sounds like the oneness of the particular Godhead that's over us in, in your model yeah. of Latter-day Saint theology is speaking of his, this is my supply okay. terms, regional cosmic jurisdiction. Regional like, cosmic jurisdiction, but also his oneness with all gods that have come before him, all gods that will come after him. So it's, it's the collective oneness of humanity with him within this idea of the divine nature. That's why I say the so, phrase particles of the divine nature. So it's it's a oneness of all the godheads, but they're still distinct. So in your view, the oneness of the, the godhead uh, distinguishes them from other godheads who have different jurisdictions over different parts of the genealogy of the gods. Yes. Okay. Yeah.
Okay, and so earlier, Jared asks, um, how do you square that with the Isaiah passages, like Isaiah yeah. 43, 10? So just for the audience, Isaiah 43, 10, before me, no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. And I, I piled onto that. The Isaiah passages say that God's not learned anything. He's incomparable to any other deity. He won't share his glory with any other deity. Um, there's none above him, beside him, before him. He's the first and the last. Whereas it seems like in the traditional Latter-day Saint uh, model, everything that God knows he learned, um, everything that God has he received, he's comparable to all other exalted deities, and he shares his glory with all other deities. Yes. So in response to the Isaiah passage, I think a really good article to read is The Four Levels of Doctrine by Anthony Sweat, Matthew, and Dirk Matt. And this talks about how to determine what is doctrine and how to determine what is opinion. So for Latter-day Saints, we don't believe that the Bible is the final authority. Um, we believe it is one of the authorities. So what is said in the Bible has to comport with the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and also has to comply with modern revelation as it is consistent over time. But and doesn't always do so. It does not always do so. And the differentiation between those two is uh, there is four levels of doctrine. And the, the first level of doctrine is the one that I am most interested in that resolves the Isaiah question, which is that it has to be said across the standard works. So the word canon means measuring stick. It's a Greek word. So what the, the canon in the Latter-day Saint tradition is the quad, as, as so, I just described. So everything that I know, I know is, in fact, doctrine has to be agreed upon in all the standard works. So I'm just repeating what you said. Yeah, go for it. Good faith effort. Yeah. Uh, what the... Uh, I'm just checking my uh, to time and uh, battery. What the Bible says, in order for it to stick, in order for it to uh, be official yeah. and binding, has to subsequently comport with other sources of Latter-day Saint revelation. Yes, and the reason for that being that, um, right, in Revel the, 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 the common throwback is in Revelation, it says you shouldn't add on to the Revelation, it says that one place in the Hebrew Bible as well. Um, and I would say that this is to express the nature of the the historical context of the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament, right, because these were not written continuously, they were not written to be a book together, let alone a book as in the Hebrew Bible and the Greek together they were written as individual apply that to the Isaiah passages so yeah. why why don't um, why don't you take the Isaiah passages as te teaching that God has never learned uh, that he doesn't have a heavenly grandfather and so forth because it doesn't agree with the Greek New Testament Pearl of Great Price um, and Doctrine and Covenants and the Book of Mormon okay yeah and then we talked about Re uh, Revelation 4 8 yes holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come um, you taught me a term. Yeah, so there's... Super superlative? Yeah, I call it super superlative, yeah. Did you make that up? Yeah, there's an actual grammatical term okay. for it, but it escaped me. Whatever that is, it sounds like Re Revelation 4 Yeah. Uh, holy, holy, holy. Uh, God is holy, holy, holy. It sounds like the angels are worshiping him for being set apart as holy, 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 who was and is and is to come. So from a Christian perspective, God never was anything less than holy, holy, holy. But it, and that, this is how our whole conversation yeah, yeah. started here. Um, why don't you read Revelation 4 8 to teach that God never was a sinner? Okay, so I would say that there are there are a couple things that we need to consider. The first is the holy, holy, holy. I kind of disagree with it being what I consider super superlative. So in Greek and Semitic languages, you also have this idea that you have superlative, such as highest, and then you could also add in Greek the word host, and there's a Semitic word that you add on to to be um, highest as possible. And that would denote an exclusivity. With holy, 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 there isn't really an exclusivity, right? Because it's it's three, so it's showing three right in Semitic and Hebrew and Jewish culture symbolizes perfection. So it's saying that God is perfected. And I would say that the holy, 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 one way that you could read that passage is that God is currently perfected in holiness. Um, so that's the first response. The second response. Oh, just, just to yeah. restate it, so I understand yeah. it. You're, you're saying holy, holy, holy is saying that God is now holy and that it's superlative in some sense? It is superlative, yes, but it's not it's not exclusive. So he's he's standing apart from others. Yes, he is holy currently. But only among, he's standing apart only from those who have not always been holy or those who are not holy or Yes. So he's but he's holy among the angels? He's holy among the angels, yes. So the angels aren't sinful in this context, would you say? Um I'm not gonna say either way. Okay. I haven't thought about it enough. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I don't know. So holy, holy, holy to you doesn't mean that he is uniquely holy. 
it means that he's uniquely holy in the sense that he's uniquely holy relative to us. To his so, local jurisdiction. Yeah, we have cosmic regional jurisdiction, yes. Okay. I cut you off on this second point. Yeah. Um, um, I think my second point was actually harking back to the cosmic regional jurisdiction, right? Because holiness is defined based, for me, for you, holiness is defined probably because God created the idea of holiness, right? God created good. Even before creation, okay, he's yeah. unique and holy. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that the idea of holiness exists outside of God, that there is an, there is eternal laws that govern the universe, so that God had to become holy. So and, there's, there's God and there's the standard of holiness. And God is perfected in holiness. He abides by the standard. Yes. Um, what is it? What God is be God. So this is not a. This is not a person. This is law, right? It's so, not a person. No. So how does it govern? What does it mean for a law to govern something? So I believe that priesthood is actually. This is a total Hannah take. This is not a doctrinal yeah. thing. Um, I just like to clarify. Um, I believe that priesthood are, is the eternal laws that govern the universe. So I believe that the universe has always existed and that in order for it to exist, it self-governs itself. Um, and that God so that's again. In order itself, for it itself governs itself. That's kind of redundant. What does it mean for an, uh, a law without a person to govern? Well, so it orders things. So like, if you, I think a good analogy would be something like the Big Bang, right? Because you have this idea that you have space within a vacuum and within this vacuum because of the laws of the universe that exist outside of God you can have particles crop up and this is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and in I forget the odds of it it's, it's absolutely minuscule when they pop up and then they combine together and form the earth so I'd say that laws that govern the universe that exist outside of God governing the universe is principles that transcend our knowledge and understanding. So I wouldn't say that I necessarily understand how they work, but I would say that I understand that they are there. So they're principles and they're I don't know. forcing the universe to act as to... to so forcing is a bit strong. They're not forcing abiding to it, but they're forcing a system where if you don't abide it, certain things result, and if you do abide, certain things Yes, and that and that, ex that that gets rid of the problem of the problem of evil, right? Because then God did not create sin. Sin exists outside of God, uh, so God cannot sin. So and, that's and he didn't create good either. He didn't create good either, no. Okay. So he's not the source of good. Okay. But he is the source of good relative to us. Okay, so yeah, we talked a little bit about that earlier, yeah. where uh, our friend over here said, I think I asked him, I think he asked me, why is it a problem if our particular deity uh, is it unique? Yeah. And I said, well, then he wouldn't be the most high. Yes, and that, that's and then, what spurred our superlative discussion, then, yeah. What, what happened, from there, you said that God is most high. With respect to us. With respect to you, and so yeah. I said, that that makes you the reference point. That makes you like you're you're like you and others under him are like you the, too, yeah. the boundary uh, reference point for his greatness. His greatness in that view is is only referential to us. Well, we understand his greatness as referential to us, but his greatness is ultimately referential to the idea of greatness. It's kind of like a platonic form sort of deal, not exactly where there's this idea of goodness and that God embodies the idea of goodness through his actions. So there is a, there's a pure idea of goodness that I cannot comprehend, but I comprehend God's goodness through my referential point. So there's an absolute involved, but also a relative. So I responded earlier, I said, that's like saying my wife is the best cook in the entire universe, dot, 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 for me. And so it takes something, um, now I might use hyperbole speaking romantically of my wife, but I'm not using it as a straightforward, superlative, literal description. And I don't want to treat God, I don't want to treat superlatives about God like they're just romantic overstatements. Um, I would disagree with that. I would say that that's not the purpose of it. I would say that that is a manifestation of the love that we have for God. Right, because like whoever I marry, I'm going to think that they're the best person in the entire world. For you. Not even for me. I will think that they are second only to God. But the, it'll be a fictional I don't in think some so. sense. But in what, in what <laughs> sense will it be true? I think it'll be true in the sense that because I chose them, that my choices and my choices consecrated by God add that goodness into my life. So I don't think it's referential in the sense that, like, sure, it, like you could argue that it's referential in the sense that everyone will have the best person for them. But I would say that it doesn't feel referential to us. 
So uh, let me ask you sure. what I asked him. Yeah. You're in the family reunion of the gods, yes. dinner table situation, yeah. and somebody bursts in the door and says, and, and your heavenly grandfather and your heavenly great uncle's there, um, and somebody bursts in and says, will the most high please stand up? All of them stand. They all stand up. They all there's, stand up. there's no particular most high God because, because in the mix. most high, I would say, refers to the idea of God. So everyone who is exalted is the most high in the sense that they have achieved godliness. And you, you achieve godliness only through the atonement of Christ. So I had a discussion with another friend of ours. There's so many loud vehicles around here. Uh, where the complaint was that the traditional Christian view of God is that he is reduced to being a mere idea, that he's um, without body parts or passions. Uh, I think that's a bit disingenuous. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I don't think the Christian um, so I used to be Catholic. I don't think the Christian conception of God is that he is a mere idea. I would say that he is a person. And that he's distinct, that like he has three distinct forms that are co-eternal, co-substantial. Um, and I would say that you can have a relationship with him. He's not a person in the sense that, at least for the traditional Christianity, he's not a person in the sense that he is not like he's not a human being. He's not someone that you could sit down to. A he's not a person in the sense of being forever having been human. Yes. Although he took a human nature. Sure. Yes. But his personal nature is independent of taking on a human nature. Yes. He's personal. Okay, so no. I, I, the substance of my question is: It seems like a traditional so, Latter-day Saint complaint that the God of the, the, of, of the Trinity mm -hmm. is impersonal; that He's without body parts or passions. And the way that language is used yeah. kind of carries with it, like, like I technically believe He's without body parts or passions in the historic sense of it, sure. but in the modern rhetorical sense of it, it sounds like He's cold, without desire, um, without love, uh, without. Uh, Intersections. Uh, I guess it is like the main intersection. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But it sounds like the. To me, it sounds like the Trinity is pregnant with with relationality. Okay. It's yeah. it's it's within the very being of God to be relational. Yeah, relational to the Father, the Son. There's a lover, and there's love, and there's loved, built built in, as it were, to the yeah. very being of God. And so there's relationship there from the very beginning, and they've always been. The Father has always been in relationship with the Son. Um, for, would, for all eternity. You wouldn't say that that's a physical relationship, right? Not physical. It's a spiritual relationship? What we're sure. Doing? Okay, spiritual. Spirit. Yeah, uh, okay. Shorthanded, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's okay. But it, it sounds like if, if I say God is what is ultimate, uh, if, if, to, to borrow somebody else's language, uh, if I say God is whatever ultimately governs all things, okay. in Trinitarian Christianity, it's a personal, tri-personal God. Yes. But in the Latter-day Saint tradition, in this model, mm -hmm. the ultimate governing thing is a, a mere idea, ironically, without body parts or passions, in, even in the modern rhetorical sense. But you embody the idea, so I'd say that the idea is inseparable from the God. Uh, but the old thing ultimately governing in this model is an idea, right? I mean, I see what you're trying to get me to say. I would say that you can't, I, 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 see, I, I don't think that you can genuinely separate the two within the model because God only can exercise priesthood authority through the existence of priesthood authority but without priesthood authority God wouldn't exist anyways. So he's dependent on the governing And priesthood law. authority is dependent on him too. Okay. So, so I think we become okay. I think we become codependent on it. This is getting into the... <laughs> that would be really funny. <laughs> I think we're safe. Yeah. We've got sprinklers. Oh, oh, you're oh, yeah. getting wet. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is where I cut a little bit. Perfect. So, so yeah. Uh, okay. So priesthood laws govern the universe. God embodies priesthood laws. And in that sense, God is the law. But Hold on. Uh, Hold on. You're good. I'm okay. just going to make sure we're focused. Okay. And in that sense, God is the law, but also the law is dependent on God. So I wouldn't say that... I wouldn't say it'd be fair to say that an idea so, governs the universe. So, so the law has always been around, sorry. The law has always been around, but so have Amateur. In my, in my view, intelligences yeah. have always been around. And that's why B-theory of time is important, too. So you reject, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, 
don't know what I'm doing. Fine. I'll totally cut this and just move. Yeah, that's no, fine. <laughs> Oh, I wish my friend Bradley were here. Bradley, I miss you. <laughs> um, okay. okay. I just need to move. So, okay, so you're in the picture more. Um, okay, so you believe we've always been around. Yes. And so the law has never been uh, existing apart from us. Yes. Um, I've read Mormons probably aren't materialists by Sam Brown. Yeah. And he talks about the light of Christ and how uh, not everything in the Mormon worldview, in the final analysis, actually seems to be material. Yeah, I would actually disagree with that. So, in what sense would you say the eternal law is material? I would say the eternal law is material in the sense that it's, it is intelligence of the same species, of the same material that we are. So it. And I always say that I don't completely understand it. And the the analogy that I always use is the word of God, right? Because I think what happened in Luke 2 is when, right, you have the angels speaking the word of God, the word of God enters into Mary. I think that that is showing a material. Um, so would you say the law has parts? Yeah, sure. Physical parts? And you, sure. could, you could divide it up into two halves? Um, I'm not sure if you could divide it up into two halves. I haven't thought about that. But it's got parts, right? I don't think you can divide anything. Yeah. That's everything that's a part. I don't know everything. So, so it's not a, it's not immaterial. Yes, I would say it has to be material. I, I'm a materialist. So a strict radical materialist. I'm a strict radical materialist. At this current point in my life, everything is atomic yeah. in yes. the in the sense of being uh, irreducible to or reducible to irreducible small parts. It's. Re to intelligence, yeah. To intelligence. Yeah. Which can be separated out into particles or something like that? I think intelligences are individual things. Like, I think you have an intelligence like here, and I think it's like, I think okay. your intelligence is ultimately indivisible. Um, so I have an atomic theory of intelligence. Is this the Pratt model? Not quite. How is it? I, I, it's kind of my own. <laughs> is this, like, tr so I, I know that the Pratt and the Truman Madsen... Yes. Uh, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting, but You're fine. the way I understand it is that uh, intelligence to Pratt is like the sum total of all the particles, yes. which are in and of themselves intelligent, yes. and they kind of merge or coalesce with others, and then persons are like corporate coalescings of... And I wouldn't entirely agree with that. I think okay. that everyone has an individual personal intelligence. I think the best way to describe like a singular. It, yes, and I think the like you said, like right here. Yeah, I actually think it's literally. In your so throat. there's, oh, <laughs> in the throat. Yeah. Why the throat? Um, I think it's I think it's symbolic of the word, I, where, where the word manifests. So it's it, that's totally my own theory. So there is a particle in your throat. That is your intelligence. Yes. And so like. Uh, I think there's your intelligence, and I think there is intelligence. I'll be critical later. I have yeah. lots of critical things to say. I'm just, I'm just trying to mine it out. <laughs> yeah, um, go for it. Uh, so you think, it's kind of like, yeah, screw it, sorry. Oh, my, yeah. Camera, I, my cameraman is not here. Um, pilot, uh, pilot seat, and then plane, or like driver car. So he's like, the intelligence is right here, sort of like, have you ever seen Men in, Men in Black? I've never uh, seen Men in Black, sorry. All right, so you yes. is right here. Yes. Like, so yeah, like, um, have you read Cleon's Gospel to the Gospel Trilogy? So he asks, like, put your hands on your head, whereas your intelligence is in above or below you. I think it's right here. I think your intelligence is a part of you. I think you have individual intelligence, and I think your spirit is created from other intelligence. So I think there is impersonal intelligence and personal intelligence. Um, so the, the personal intelligence has always existed. Yes. And the impersonal intelligence is a substance. Yes. And that the spiritual begetting event with it's the unification of this is the is heavenly parents. Yes. Uh, I I always use uh, circumspect language here. There is some male female event in premortality. Sure. You know, yeah. A union of some sort. Uh, people gonna get squeamish about if I use. It's sex. More, oh, okay, okay. I think it, I think sex is eternal, so. So, uh, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, in some sexual conception event, yes. unified the particle of self yes. with the larger set of immaterial substance of, also called intelligence, but yes. a separate kind of intelligence. Yes. 
So, what's it called? Monism? Or is it, that's like one, there's only one kind of thing? I'm not sure, yeah. Uh, but this is, there's two, there's, so in, in, in your model, there's two fundamentally different kinds of things in reality. Yes. There's intelligences, yes. uh, individua individuated, yeah. and there's intelligence stuff yeah. that is not like um, brain cells. Yeah, that's internal that God uses to organize this matter. Okay. That it is itself a finer form of matter. Okay. And this is like a this is like a synthesis. This is a synthesis of Brigham and Talmadge. Yeah, Brigham, Talmadge, Pratt, Skousen. I would say that those are my main influences, and then probably a Semitic reading of Abraham and Moses. Who would you say in modern Mormonism, Latter-day Saint theology? Uh, articulates best and that approximates this? Um, I think everyone would want me to say Blake Osler. I wouldn't say that though, because he's, he's... If I had to pick someone, I would probably pick just what I've heard from my professor, Dr. Ellison. He said something kind of similar. I would say that I'm a bit more unique, so I don't want to equate... Um, I think this is something that, again, I don't think it's doctrinal, so I think it's more opinionated. Mine is kind of a hodgepodge of opinions that I've heard. Favorite Mormon philosopher? Oh, what a question. Are we, can we include prophets in that? No. No? Okay, then Osler. Osler. Yeah. Uh, he, obviously not, I don't think he's a P-theory. No, he's not. Vigorously not P-theory, right? Vigorously not P-theory. I also, I also do like Skinner. I, I'm a big fan of Skinner. Um, Andrew Mormon, Skinner? Yeah, Mormonism doesn't really have a lot of philosophers or theologians. Um, I also do like Hugh Nibley. I think As a philosopher? He, yes, and I like Skousen. I'm a total Skousen nerd. So actually, let me retract that. Skousen's my favorite. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, McConkie? I love McConkie. Why? I think McConkie represents this sort of harshness that Jesus also represents, I think, in modern Christianity. We, bold clarity? Yeah, bold clarity, right? Because Jesus said, oh, you generations of vipers, like, he called people snakes, he called people hypocrites, he cleansed the temple. I think too often we focus on the compassionate side of Jesus while seeing that true compassion, well, forgetting that true compassion is also laying down the law. So I'm a big Brigham, Joseph, McConkie fan. And King Paul Discourse. Love it. Doctrine. Doctrine? Doctrine. Uh, According to the church's website. Sermon in the Grove. Doctrine. Uh, just for reference, that's where Joseph Smith says that Revelation 1-6 yes. teaches that the Father has a Father. Yes. I would say that that is naturally doctrine because of the Ken Follett Discourse, which we consider to be doctrine according to the church's website. And do doctrine for you is defined as? Doctrine is defined as an eternal unchanging truths. Eternal unchanging truths, even if they're not officially enforced or something like that. Yeah, I think that we need to, I, I will say that I think we need to have a more systematic way of enforcing them, um, but I would say that they, they are eternal unchanging truths. Yeah. Uh, any, anything else of interest to you? Um, I think that's it. In, in, inter, interrogation that you'd like to do? Um, sure, can I interrogate you? Yes. Okay, so how would you then reconcile Let's do something fun. How would you reconcile the agency of man with predestination in the sense that, right, because in the Roman sense, you're planning the election is already made sure. So just to be clear, like you would say that someone is destined to be in the religion that they're in currently. Um, and everything is destined to Everything. Work. Everything yeah. is destined to yeah. So how do you, would you say that then we continually choose God's path for us? He's decided everything that will come to pass through different mechanisms, okay. um, secondary causes being one of them, and some of that is uh, external manipulation of nature, some of that is the secondary causes of our own voluntary wills, and then like, how do you like draw a line between that and then his decree? Yes. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I just, it's, a, it's more of a submission to scripture. Uh, he has declared the present, the past, and the future, according to Isaiah. Um, he's, even the most dramatic sins, he's predestined. So there has yeah. to be some sort of way of putting the dots together there where God has decided what will, what will come to pass while maintaining his own holiness okay. and uh, maintaining our human responsibility and then the genuineness of our choices. And then the, the philosophy says, you know, no way, how do you do that? And I just... Do you I, sit with it? I, I yeah, sit with it. Um, so if you just sit with it then, then what... 
Well, then uh, this might be a dumb question, but I, I always feel like I need to ask this question. So, what is the emphasis on preaching the gospel then? Because, right? So, like, I personally, believe, I will never leave the church, um, and I believe that that's the right path for me. And I'm like fairly certain of that. So, why would you then emphasize preaching the gospel so much as right? Because evangelical literally means someone who preaches the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. So, why would you emphasize that so much? And how is that not kind of contrary to this idea that everything is already determined? Tell me if you think this is a basic answer. Sure, I probably um, will. <laughs> it, it's, God has ordained the, the ends as well as the means. Okay. And the means of salvation that he has chosen is preaching. So, on a, on a personal level, it's like, oh wow, there's a lot of committed Mormons in Utah or who are apatheists or progressive Mormons or like just ex-Mormon stubborn atheists, um, why would I waste my time preaching, evangelizing, proselytizing, sharing the word, um, using methods that the world thinks is ineffective? Um, why would I do that? It's because God predestined that the preaching of the word would draw people to himself and glorify him and make his name great among the nations. So do they still have to choose to join? Okay, so if they have to choose to be Christian, how can you choose something that is predestined? I, do, I don't know. Okay. I, that's that just goes back. I, okay. Yeah. I'm Sorry, not. I'm not. A, I, yeah. Yeah. I would probably. I would probably just mine the resources of compatibilist Christian philosophers. But, but the first order for me is um, scripture. I don't want to go beyond what scripture says, um, either explicitly or by good and necessary inference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if scripture teaches it, I, I just want to like a child submit to it and believe it. So then, I guess the other question that I would have is with the historical compilation of the Bible, right? Because we know that the Bible is scripture that is God breathed. So we believe that these men were apostles, or in the case of Paul, a less formal apostle. Mm -hmm. um, so, One untimely born. Yes. Um, and prophets, specific, specifically referring to the Hebrew Bible, but not to exclude people like Ruth. Um, we believe that these books, well, let's just see what we agree on. Do you agree that they were written separately? Like, Ruth was written separately from Genesis, was written separately from 1 Corinthians, and that God may have predestined for them all to be together, but that the prophets and people who wrote these... Well, they're distinct works. Yeah, so they're distinct, okay. So, if they're distinct, how do you read them then as a har harmony? Um, the dual authorship of scripture okay. is that uh, all of scripture has two voices, um, in a sense, the human voice and then the divine voice. And so the dual authorship unifies. So the, the human authors are not the same voice, but beneath them they have the same divine voice. So okay. one um, unified voice of God in all the expressions of scripture. Can I press you on manuscript transmission then? Because right, we don't have any what is considered original text um, of the Hebrew Bible or of the Greek New Testament. And I'm not one of those people. I don't think there were nefarious monks in their little monasteries like Cons per purposely. Conspiracies. Yeah, I'm not one of those people. But I think that there are some textual changes, right? Like, you know, like the woman, um, the woman with the casting of the stone, um, the, the yep. woman caught in the adultery. John 8, there. long yeah. ending of Mark, 1 John 5. Yeah, seven so and these eight. things are, yeah. these things just for them. The three big ones. Yeah, they're not, they're not original to the Bible. And especially with the John one, that was actually found more so in Luke than it was in John. So then how would you determine, like, what, what, what determining factor do you use for what is canonical Bible? Um, I tried to look at the best evidence for what's reconstructed of the originals. Okay. So it's just the science of textual criticism. So which, which version do you use? I use the ESV, but I like okay. the CSB, okay. NASB, um, I, I, all the... Uh, <laughs> I forget which Greek text I have, but I'm not... The Noam Testamentum Brite, the, NA, the Nestle, Nestle Allen? Nestle Allen, I think is yes. what it's called. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I don't... I'm not enough of a nerd to, to go too deep on that, but gotcha. just uh, a, a good faith, studious reconstruction of the originals. Okay. And so what that looks like in practice for when somebody's not a scholar is they... You really can just pick... Um, any major modern English translation sure. that has decent footnotes, and if there's any, um, so, so the, if there's any like really interesting textual variants, there will be a footnote. And the the, the interesting ones to me are um, 
Yeah. I think I heard, uh, what's his name? The, oh, sorry, Daniel Wallace talks about different kinds of textual variants. So there's hundreds of thousands of textual variants. Oh, yeah, definitely. But I think if you look at that, there are criticisms as much, yeah. Most of them are pretty boring. Um, and so he uses uh, the category of meaningful and viable. Yeah. And so you might have the misspelling of a name. Uh huh, which uh, is not, not meaningful. meaningful. Yeah. Um, or you might have something that's meaningful of a change, but it's not a viable contender for an original reading. Sure. So for a variant to be interesting, it has to be both meaningful uh, and viable. And I would say uh, it has to be something that's potential uh, in its impact and how I actually read the larger meaning of the text, like the, sure. like the, like the larger message. Like that. So that comes down to like a few dozen interesting, contested between someone like uh, Daniel Wallace and Bart Ehrman. Yeah, definitely. It, it, so it's a pretty short list. Um, and I, on those, I can just say I don't know. OK, so then this kind of leads into a greater question about canon then too, right? Because as we know, the these were canonized afterwards. So do you think that there was any sort of authority in, in canonizing them? Um, do you trust the canonization process? Would you argue that? The, because I, I think that this is this is an interesting question I like to ask a lot of, particularly evangelicals and just non, non-Catholics, Orthodox, or Latter-day Saints, right? Because you don't believe in the priesthood authority that we, we adhere to, and you don't believe in this idea that there has to be a necessary structure. Hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, so I would say that. A large hierarchy. Yeah, so. Maybe, maybe the, a local church hierarchy. And the canonization is kind of problematic Jesus if we think about it, right? Because Jesus you have said, books, they, they did it based on what we call like authorship guidelines, like whether or not you knew who the author was. There's authors by tradition, there's authors by knowledge. Um, you did it with what comports with other things, right? Like the Gospel of Thomas is the sayings gospel. They kind of threw that out because they were like, oh, that's probably not. That doesn't, there's some harsh sayings in there that people probably were uncomfortable. Well, it's kind of Gnostic. So then, my question would be: What do you think of the canon, and how can you have this perspective on the canon without this idea of Christian authority? And so, I, I love the question. Um, if I could add to the question, go for it. Yeah. Um, I have uh, a friend who joined Eastern Orthodoxy, and I have a few friends that have flirted with Eastern Orthodoxy. Yeah. And the same exact question, or maybe a similar question, is. Um, what of the authority of the canonization councils or process? And so I, I've given them a similar answer that maybe you, that would help answer this question. Is Scripture is self-authorizing. It, it has uh, self-authenticating. It uh, has its own authority. Um, it it's, uh, has its own beauty. But the, the, the idea... Can you defend that from the Bible? This would not be an, uh, chiefly an inferential okay. belief. So I, it's it it's like the it, it's hitting rock bottom. It's like um, if you read the Protestant confessions, okay. um, they talk about how nature and the unity of Scripture, uh, well, uh, nature and the Church, uh, really the Church, yeah. speaks as a second witness, as it were. I, I don't know the language it uses. It it, it, it testifies of Scripture like that. But the, the voice of scripture itself, its own internal authority, is like the final thing you bump up against. It, okay. it's, um, there's a very similar quote. It's not what he meant, but it's similar to C.S. Lewis. If, no, if nothing is self-evident, nothing can be proven. Yeah. And if nothing is uh, obligatory for its own sake, nothing is obligatory so you, at all. you take scripture as self-evident? It has its own self-evidencing authority. Yeah. Okay. So upon inspiration, it has it was authoritative, sure. and upon delivery, it, I'm not asking you to. Uh, 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 in general, I'm not. Hey, friends. Hey, Nick. I wasn't, but I could. So the the when it was received by the Christian community, that authority wasn't increased or amplified. It was simply discovered, not invented. So when the councils decided, hey, that's scripture, that's scripture, that's scripture, they're, not, they're really not introducing authority or stamping it with extra authority. They're just recognizing it for what it already has. So would, would you, how do you trust that then is my other question, right? Because there's other really great works like the you know, Gospel of Mary that I would say that are inspirational, that do bring light. Okay, so... Wh- Those are not the, not the Nag Hammadi yeah. Gnostic stuff. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. I don't agree with everything in there, but I also don't agree with everything in the scripture. Um, but I would say that, I would say like, how is it self-evident to you that this is scripture and that other things are not scripture if if there isn't this sort of standard? Do you, do you see what my question is probing at? 
So the first layer is when I read it, it just doesn't seem like scripture. Okay. And yeah. it, it, uh, the, the secondary answer is even um, if you have something that completely sounds like scripture, like I, there was a video that someone did where they went and they read verses from the Book of Mormon that people thought were from the Bible because the exact same ideas were, were introduced. And I'll say like I'm not even talking about the things that disagree with the Bible. I'm talking about the verses that completely agree with the Bible that are not from the Bible. Um, yeah. And people thought they were from the Bible and that felt like scripture to them. So, so I'm not okay. trying to be edgy in my language. Go for it. In a different context, I would be edgy, but not right now. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I do think the Book of Mormon is like a massive copy-paste, mass, massive copy-pasta. Not like like Microsoft Word copy-paste, but like S Smith seems like he was, like he just breathed out scripture in the sense that, uh, sorry, yeah. no pun intended, but he, uh, he knew the King James language really well. Have you ever looked into word print studies? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you the see the war of eight, the, the war. The, the war. Well, so the, the view of the Hebrews is the one that people commonly say, but that one's kind of been trashed. The war but of eighteen twelve. Oh yeah, that one. But the, I, the, the engrams. Yeah, and I was talking more about the word print studies that were done to show that oh, the distinct authorship. Yeah, yeah, and how pretty much all of those agree that they were distinct authors. So I don't have an opinion on that. I, okay. I will look at it more. But okay. but just as somebody who knows the King James language, when I read the Book of Mormon, I'm like, oh, he lifted that from Peter. Oh, he lifted that from Paul. Oh, he lifted that from John. And if I yeah. could, if I could throw a little bit of a bomb out here, okay. it sounds like uh, Skousen. Sure, Cleon. Well, Royal. Oh, okay. Uh, his studies of the Book of Mormon text lead him to believe that the Book of Mormon was uh, already translated into an early modern English. I think it said, and that when Smith translated or dictated whatever model you take from the seer stones in his view he's dictating I think an existing English translation that was produced hundreds of years earlier and as I understand that view taken by a few other Mormons or entertained by a few other Mormons is that the Elizabethan I'm not sure the early modern English yeah we could call it Shakespearean English right from which the King James derives or whatever seems like the Book of Mormon lifts a lot of that and there's there has to be a you have to come up with a historical explanation for why well i would say that the historical explanation would be that the, K the king james version of the bible was the predominant version of the bible for the specific area so that would be why that's why we still have the kgb the reason we still use the kgb is for the jst and similarities to the book of mormon so i would say that okay, I, okay just so, to be clear i don't think smith wrote the book of mormon um so that that's also a critical difference yeah. oh yeah but when he translated it in your view We have six minutes left. Okay, I think God knew what he was doing. So I basically think that God understood that the KJV would be that translation. So I think that God used early modern English because that was not the English that Joseph Smith would have spoken to. And I think that stands as another evidence for the Book of Mormon. Yes, he would have been familiar with it, but he was also illiterate. So I think that God knew that Joseph Smith would be kind of familiar, not really though, uh, with early modern English and that he was using that to comport with the KJV. So I think that that's why it's in. How participatory do you think Smith was in the process? Um, I, I don't really know. I would say, I don't like to own up to things that I don't know. I would say my initial reaction is that he used his ear stone, also looked in the hat, and I would But maybe say, the mental okay. model, the paradigm of the King James language was used in the translation process for thoughts, thought uh, articulation? I think God used that because he was going, because the KJV would be the counter. So I don't think it came from Joseph Smith actively. I don't think so, so that he was that smart. Simply put, God chose, in this view, the King James language to be the language of the Book of Mormon. Yes. Okay. So back to the authority of Scripture. Yeah. I don't think I don't think councils added. I just think they recognized existing authority in the Christian community, even before the councils. Uh, I think a lot of what the councils were doing were just recognizing the, the scriptures that Christian communities had already received as scripture. So then what do you say about what was lost then, right? Because we, we know that like within Corinthians there's this whole debate that like it seems that Paul is alluding to another language, like the letter of Pierce, that we don't, that some people will say like... I, third letter? Yeah, some people yeah. say that like... Um, Second is third or something like Raymond that. Raymond Brown I think says that it's actually like in the first, but like there's kind of disagreement about that. Um, so what would you say about that, like the things that are lost? Would you consider the things that are lost also scripture that are alluded to within scripture? Scripture I take to be verbal inspired expressions that God intended to be for the public life of the continuing church. So God ordained for ordained to the loss of that scripture. Yeah, okay. and, and there could have been other inspired verbal expressions of the apostles 
that was equally authoritative, but not meant for public dissemination and public, uh, yeah, in scripture. Uh, yeah. Verbal for you has to be graphical too. Uh, written? Yeah, like scratched it. Oh, they, they could have been verbal, just an audible yeah. verbal. Audible yeah. verbal, okay. It, but there's something special about verbal expressions that God meant for the, that and not pictures. Yeah, I agree, because like the word of God, right, like we see this all throughout scripture that's talking about Jesus Christ, so I agree that there's so sola scriptura for me is basically looking at what is extant of the verbally inspired authoritative expressions of God's revelation. Okay, and then I guess my last question is, why don't you learn Hebrew and Greek? I, I do know Greek, kind of sort of okay. amateurish. I've taken some online conversational Greek courses. Okay. I keep forgetting and relearning. Sure, yeah. Um, and I do, you do have the Bible Vocab app on your yes, phone? Yes, I do, yeah. That is awesome. It's, it's has both at the space mem memory. Yeah. yeah. I also see Bible Hub, Bible Gateway. These are great resources. Blue Letter Bible, too, is great. Yeah, add yeah. one, uh, uh, BibleWebApp.com. Yeah. You know that one? Yeah. By John Dyer at uh, DTS. You can uh, hi hover. So if you don't like zero Greek, you can just hover, click, yeah. hover, see the... the you can kind of get dangerous with that with word study fallacies, but um, I don't know a lick of Hebrew yet. Okay, yeah. I was going to say, I think it might be good because if we take this idea of Sola Scriptura, which I don't adhere to, um, I think it's actually kind of like how you would call the Quran that's in English, the Quran you would call it the translation of the Quran. Okay. So I would make an argument that we, if we're going to stick with Scripture alone, then would it make more sense to say that there's the translation of scripture, but the Greek and Hebrew has to be authoritative. If, I, if I'm, uh, if I'm understanding your question yeah. correctly, because God inspired the Hebrew and Greek, and He didn't write it in English, yeah, um, despite the KJV only um, attitude sometimes, yeah, um, <laughs> uh, then it seems appropriate for people who are di diving into the study of scripture long term, yeah. if the tools are available to them and if they have the capacity for it to start learning Greek and Hebrew. And I would say that like uh, a common Christian could learn the alphabet. Yep. They can learn the pronun a, a pronunciation scheme. Sure. Thank you for saying A. <laughs> An Erasmian or reconstructed Koine era, whatever. But uh, um, So you, you could just do YouTube videos on the, the alphabet, pronunciation scheme, like cases and voices. Yep. Um, and then just learn the different categories. Tenses too, yeah. Tenses. Yeah. Uh, and then and then you're gonna get pretty far in uh, kind of doing software. Yeah, because you can do John one pretty easily if you just have the basics down. And it gets really dangerous really quick because you think you know more than you do at that level. Yeah, exactly. But and it's, you also it's don't enough. Read other stuff, so yeah. you have to be humble with it and be careful not to go too far with it. But I think that for the common Christian uh, with the internet, yeah, uh, that's. I haven't done it with Hebrew yet, but uh, I totally agree. So I, if someone's going to do a seminary education, yeah. they should learn the original languages. I agree. And, uh, but when it comes to English translations, um, I, I have only increased in my respect. I used to be a little bit of a translation snob. Um, yeah. And now I'm like more uh, empathetic. I think all translation is interpretation, and if you are going to use translations, you should use multiple translations and, and that would kind of result in my translations not worrying. Yeah, if yeah. you've got a Bible study with five friends, five yeah. translations that are decent and mainstream at least. Yeah, do, do mainstream, don't do like Jehovah's Witnesses yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. It, it actually adds, I think, to the discussion. It doesn't subtract to it. I agree. Uh, and uh, you can kind of lean sometimes on the NASB or something that's more yeah. wood, wooden. I won't even say liberal, wooden. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's not scary to me at all. I, I love, I, I've only fallen in love more with the major translations because they do a lot of hard, they accomplish a lot of hard work and clarity. Um, and yeah, anyway, we could talk more about it. We got 30 yeah. seconds. Hannah, it was really nice to talk. Uh, should we? Yeah, it's COVID yeah, season. COVID, yeah. Yeah, thank you. For, so um, I think it's good to nerd out sometimes. Obviously, I have a lot of critical things to say about virtually everything that you said at, at the end. Same here. Yeah. Um, but it's good to have a season of exploration. Definitely. And, um, curiosity so 15 seconds awesome. so thank you stay safe you too take care <laughs> awesome